The work that people do, like people who are successful, mm -hmm. there's work that happens behind the scenes exactly. that people don't see. Yeah. You know, when I'm up at four in the morning painting walls and moving heavy furniture and... You, know. you see I'm south side reppin', yeah. big foot steppin', Ooh. zone three section, this guy flow perfection. Yeah. Dating on the church like I ain't blessed, they section. If we ain't talking money, I got a weak connection, that's on the hood. Yeah. She said get a bag, so I get it, got it good. Don't complain about my problems, I just put it in a wood. Seen a genie the other day, she said Gee. make it good. So I wish for a good health, then I wish to look. It's sheep, not lieutenant. Yeah, I'm back, been a minute. My hard work gets you offended. Shout out my boy, academic. You two, 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 independent. No, you, you, you scam it. Behind that twinkle in your eye, I see the skin. Exactly, yep. I know exactly what you mean. All right. You ready to go? Yeah. All right. Another episode of Minnesota's number one daily show live on Lake Street. Special guest in the building. Finally, we got we got the man, Elliot Vreeland, in the building, man. What's going on, man? How you feeling today? Man, I'm feeling good, man. It's good, cool. uh, it's good to come here and meet you in person. You know, sure. I've had a, uh, you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> identity mistaken. You know, I got, it's funny, man. Just lately, man, it's uh, it's it's been on a regular basis. People coming up to me at uh, at events and festivals and even out at clubs and whatnot. And like, are you Jake? You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> you, you know, I was like, no, no, no. Finally, after like the fourth person asked me if I was Jake Faircloth, I was like. Yeah, you want to get on my podcast? Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. He's like, hell yeah, I want to get on your podcast. I like, you got a little too excited. I had to break it to him. I'm like, nah, I'm just kidding, man. I'm not Jake. Uh, it's so uh, funny because the day the day you made that post yeah. on Facebook, ironically, we had Mike the Martyr in the building that day. Yeah, yeah. And he was telling me a story about how he ran into you at, I don't remember what venue. I think it was First Ave, he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I walked up to him, and I was like, yeah, you Jake Faircloth? And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I, I had never even thought about it before that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. That's it great. Was, it was funny. And then uh, his, I think his friend was with him laughing because he knew who, he, who I was, and he just let, <laughs> he let him go. He was like, I'm going to just watch this play out. <laughs> I've, yet, I've yet to have it go the other way. No? Nobody's come up and asked me if I was you yet. Yeah, well, you got you to gotta step I'm your wait. joke game up. I'm waiting. Maybe I do. You might be right. You might be right. I might have to. So, man, you got a lot of um, – You have a, for one, you have a very uh, – you have an interesting path. Yeah. Because you you didn't take the the path that they say you have to take in comedy. Yeah. You've really paved your own way. Yeah. And, you know, they – From the very beginning. And I'm, you know, I'm big into comedy. Like, yeah. I love – I'm a big fan of stand-up comedy. I follow a lot of stand-up comedians. And so I hear a lot of conversation about how the comedy circuit works. Yeah. And like you go out, you got to put in the open, you got to do the open mics, you got to, yeah. you got to bomb, you got to do all this. But you've really taken, you kind of, yeah. you kind of, uh, you kind of leapfrogged that. Yeah. And just built your own path. Yeah. Well, I remember that when I first, I, it was my first show I ever did. And I did like 20 minutes. And uh, I brought so many people to the show. I was booked for a show to do a 10-minute set. I brought so many people, they ended up having a second show with yeah. me as the headliner. And I headlined it like 20 minutes. And I'm like, man, I'm good. So I went, <laughs> up to the, I went up to the House of Comedy like a couple of days later. I'm like, hey, you guys need a host, headliner, feature? I could do it all. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had only hold, held a mic in my hand a couple of times. Uh, and they're like, uh, no, you ne actually, you need to, uh, you, you're probably, you're not as good as you think you are. Right. Go do open mics for three years mm -hmm. and then come back and talk to me. And I'm like, fuck that. You know, I'm a single dad. I got a bunch of kids. I don't got time to just be at this. And these open mics a lot of times are just bars, you know, yeah. pizza places that have a bunch of comedians. I'm like, no, nah, I want to, you know what I mean? I don't want to just do comedy with other comedians. You know what I mean? I like people to be there, yeah. you know? So I, uh, I remember I put together a show at T's Place uh, on Lake Street. Yep. And, uh, man, like 200 people showed up. Uh, I remember the owner, he was like, man, this is the most money I ever made mm -hmm. in one day since wow. I started owning a restaurant, you know? Yeah. And people were just excited, like, no way Elliot's doing comedy. So there was like that excitement in the beginning. And then there was a promoter there who was like, man, who did this show? Put this show together. And then I, uh, he ended up booking me for a show. I opened up for B. Cole, got a radio interview on KMOJ. And this is my fourth time doing comedy. Wow. And I'm getting radio interviews. And then I, I think I sold like 120 tickets to that show. Hmm. You know, so that's another thing. It's like I tell newer comedians, like, hey, you know, I was new, but I had hustle. Yeah. I was selling tickets. Yep. I was literally paying myself. And people were getting paid to book me. Wow. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's, there's that part of it. You and know? this is fresh off of you being a preschool teacher is that right yep yep i actually um 
Yep, I was. Uh, that's the day I started doing comedy. I was a preschool teacher. I was like, you know what? I want to get my own classroom. I went to MCTC. It took me about eight years to get a two-year degree at MCTC. You know, just going <laughs> part time. And then I go apply to be a lead teacher as a preschool. It's a fourteen-dollar an hour job. Yeah. And they're like, oh, it took you so long to get your degree. The standards changed. Now you need a four-year degree. And I'm like, what the fuck? I just went to school for eight years to get this two-year degree for a $14 an hour job that doesn't even, you know what I mean? Yeah. But that day, um, that day I went to, uh, I went to the Hexagon Bar. I rounded up a bunch of people. There was an open mic at the Blue Nile. I got about 20 people together, did an open mic, and it went good. And I'm like, you know what? Even though I didn't get this trash promotion at this preschool job, I have something else now to be excited about. Sure. And it kind of filled that little anger that i got for you know what i mean how much longer did you continue to do your job at the preschool i ended up uh i taught preschool for a total of like 15 years so i still oh, wow. i still worked there and i uh i received a couple education awards for my early literacy expertise and you know i uh i enjoyed doing it for a while but then eventually i just kept having more kids and i'm just like little kids at home started, little your, own, kids started your own preschool yep yep yeah. and then i had a friend of mine who wanted to sell his house and he was like man you know because i'm pretty good at stuff you know what i mean that's one of my <laughs> models i'm good at stuff and yeah. he was like man i wish you were my agent and it light bulb went off and i'm like you know what i went and looked it up i'm like dang it's like 780 bucks to sign up for classes i'm like you know what uh the next day i called him i said hey i'm signed up for real estate classes just give me a month and I'll uh, I'll be a real estate agent. I already got one sale. You know what I mean? That'll yeah. pay for the expenses to start my real estate. business. What was his reason? Why did he? Why? What would? What made him say like I wish you were my agent? Because he was just having a hard time getting a hold of his agent. Yeah. He said he felt like he was burdening him to look at houses. Mm. You know. And then the first house he bought the agent talked him out of getting a duplex. He ended up with a single family house. And then he was like, man, I don't, she like talked me out of it. She like swayed me into doing the opposite of what I was trying to do. You know what I mean? And he was just like, I know if I'm working with Elliot, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. Yeah. Whatever Elliot's going to do what I want him to do. So you stepped into the, the, the realtor realm. You're still, you're doing that currently. Currently, yeah. You have like a... Uh, so I just recently started uh, my own team. So last year, yeah. I've kind of manifested starting my own real estate team. I started my own training program and doing these once a month team meetings. I created a scholarship program. I've paid for three people now to go to real estate school. And then they join my team when they graduate and get their license. And then uh, I give them some additional mentorship. And I actually have it set up so they actually make more money per transaction to join my team than they would working as an individual. So, Jeez. you know, it's like, you know, I encourage them. I'm like, well, go shop around, see if you can find something better. You know yeah. what I mean? It's going to be hard to do, especially somebody in the beginning, you know, who could probably use some mentorship. Now you can say, hey, I know this is my first sale, but I'm working hand-to-hand -hand with an experienced agent to ensure that I don't make any mistakes just because I'm new Yeah. type of thing. So you're a realtor, a stand-up comedian, you also just opened a venue, which I want to talk about. Yeah. And you also started like a comedy camp. Yep. So I helped start it. Yeah. Me, Jatan White, Nita Kellogg, and Ashley Henderson run a stand-up comedy camp. So well, let's talk about the comedy camp first. That's so so that was uh it was it was before COVID. A woman named Jatan Jatan White. She's uh works for NAS Northside Achievement Zone. Okay. Had this idea to start a comedy camp. Brought me and Ashley. Took me and Ashley out for a salad and was like, hey, I have this idea. And then uh, COVID happened, kind of, you know, didn't. Slowed everything yeah, down. Yeah, slowed everything down. Everybody's quarantined and stuff like that. And then as things started to open back up, she's like, she, she had been working on a syllabus and getting everything organized. She even found some funding, got us a grant where we're actually able to pay the students who attend the camp $25 an hour every time they show up. And it started out in this uh, church basement in North Minneapolis, and the kids is coming in, and they're like, man, you know, we're asking them why they came. It's like, oh, my mom made me come, you know, and <laughs> there's a bunch of high schoolers who weren't that excited. Something and, to do. Yeah, it looks like some janky after-school program, yeah. and, you know, but then as they, you know, as we got to know them a little more, and, you know, I asked them some questions, like, hey, uh, you know, who's your favorite comedian? You know, a lot of them are saying DC Young Fly, Carlos Miller, Chico Bean. I'm like, well, I've actually been on tour with these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, you know, I got videos and pictures with them, and yeah. you know what I mean. I can get them on a FaceTime call if we want. You know, stuff like that. And then Ashley, they got to know her. Like, wow, she is 
viral. She's yep. millions of views on TikTok. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yep. You know, and then we ended up and then and then we're like six months into the camp. And it's like, all right, so nobody's got one joke. Nothing, you know, because it was a lot of, you know, it was it was a new thing, too. Yeah. And, you know, we're doing a lot of activities and uh, stuff to get to know each other, get them comfortable and things like that. But then um, we ended up adjusting or we ended up changing the location inside of uh, one of my business partner has a venue inside of Southdale. I used to do shows at. So then once we changed the ambiance for the students and now there's a stage, there's a microphone, there's big projector screens, there's chair you know what i mean yeah you saw the excitement they all yeah. wanted to get up there and hold the microphone yeah. and then you know from there we saw the um them starting to create some material and start figure out which direction they want to go do they want to do skits do they want to do stand-up you know there was a time where ever, uh, where nobody wanted to do stand-up because they didn't want to get up there That's scary but then by the end we actually had four of the students um do stand-up comedy um and stand up there all on their own and stage uh, we got them to get a routine together. Then we would practice and practice. So every week we would have some time at the end where they actually did their routine, practiced the routine. And then uh, we had the finale show. A lot of people, we had all, you know, all the families, friends, supporters, kids, principals coming, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they all did a great job. They all nailed it. That's and so everybody dope. was laughing. And then after the show, we sat the kids down and for a little Q&A. And there's... Uh, kids like this one kid who used to always carry this puppet around in school he would always get in trouble he's like you're not supposed to bring this puppet and the principal would have to hold the puppet in the principal's office and the principal who was held off his puppet came to the thing and it was a real touching story to see this kid who always got in trouble from bringing this puppet everywhere using this puppet to do Comedy, a phenomenal yeah. Yeah. little stand-up routine yeah you know that's and, great yeah and it was just like uh because I saw him come come in with this puppet, and I'm like, oh, that's that's comedy gold right there. If, yeah. You know what I mean? It can be if you do it right. If you do it, it right. It also be a nightmare if you don't. Yeah, because uh, it's, yeah, without, you know, yep. proper plan and preparation, yep. it's you're just kind of annoying people. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. So uh, that's great. That's amazing. You're like, cult, you're, and then, cult and then you're son, cultivating stand, like, comedians. Now, my son was 11 years old. He's doing comedy. Yeah. You know, which is kind of a cool thing. Is he you funny? Know? He's funny. Is he's it? good. Does he I, think does he think you're funny? He thinks he's funnier than me. Okay. But he has no idea. He's never actually even been to a show. He doesn't have any idea. But he's oh, okay. he's you know whatever. <laughs> he's a cocky little kid. Yeah. Uh, but he uh, he wasn't funny at all. Like all he would ever you know he would do the same joke all the time. Yeah. He's like you know da 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 da. Your hairline looks like the letter M. You know, give me the McDonald's hairline <laughs> joke. You know, he did give me a good one one time though. I was it was early in the morning. We're getting ready for school. And I'm like, uh, I asked him to go start the cars, winter cold. You know, I'm getting all these kids ready in the morning. And I'm like, is the car running? He's like, nah, but your hairline's running. I said, <laughs> man, it's too early for this shit, man. Ain't nobody got time for your jokes. <laughs> and then it took a little oh, while on the ride to drop him good. off. I'm like, you know what? Because I got mad. I was pissed off. I was tired, <laughs> crabby. But I, 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 on the way to school, I'm like, you know what? That was actually a good, good one. That was probably your best joke yeah, yet. For sure. Actually. For yeah. sure. So um, I heard that you were hosting events on the roof of South Del Mall? Yeah. Yeah. So literally. I'll just let you go. I don't know what, I don't even know what to so say about that. it's COVID. Yeah. The venue is not COVID. The venue that I was utilizing wasn't COVID friendly. And the venue was inside of the mall? It's inside of South Dale. It's inside of South Dale. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's where we were doing the comedy camp too. But it was the ceilings were too low. It just didn't fit protocol, yeah. po COVID protocol. So we took it out on the roof. We didn't have permission of the mall. We were just like, we're going to keep doing this till somebody <laughs> figures it out. Yeah. But the, they just redid the roof. It was all, it was perfect. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and the shows were selling out. I had to stop doing one show. I was doing two shows a night. And I had, you know, this long line of people dressed up ready to try to get on the roof and eventually security is like why are all these people dressing up to come to southdale nobody's ever even here <laughs> you know so it didn't take long to attract attention because it's southdale how long do you, how long did this last uh we just did a few shows a few shows and then i fell in love with outdoor shows and rooftops and yeah. since then i've actually acquired all the equipment, stage, projector screen TVs, flat screen TVs, speakers, microphones, enough chairs and tables to do a 500-person outdoor event 
So I've been wow. like, I've been, I've had hundreds of meetings going to venues, businesses, you know, trying to find people's roofs who aren't ready for it. Like, can we remodel this and I can bring money that wouldn't normally be here? Like this roof is a gold mine, you know? Hey, and not I, for nothing, my backyard is about an acre. Oh, hey, we, we got we got we got an house in there. I don't know, you know if I want a lot of people at my house, but we could talk about. It. I don't know. And then I found a parking lot, a parking lot of seven corners, and now uh, connected to this parking lot was like a. Uh, it used to be a church, and now, now I have a parking lot that I have access to. I can do up to twelve permitted shows. And what I ran into doing shows in like just open spaces is the per, the alcohol permit. Mm. So last year I was going to do a show. I found this great outdoor space, but I didn't have the proper permitting to sell alcohol. Can't you just serve alcohol and take donations? So it's a slippery slope. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was just wanted to do something because be when you believe in something, you want to just try to do it the right way. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? So sure. Instead of trying to cut the corner. So I yeah. went and got like a food handlers catering certificate to try to start one of those mobile wedding things. And then I found out that to do a event of that size, it needs to be tied to a brick and mortar. I was looking at buying re a restaurant that was out of business just so I could say I had a brick and mortar and not really serve food, but just sell alcohol <laughs> outside because I fell in love with their rooftop yeah, show. Yeah. And um, now I have, you know, 12 permits a year. Uh, I just opened up a venue that's connected to the parking lot. And I'm actually um, working on a converting and remodeling a bar and a restaurant into a comedy bar where it will not be any live performances it'll just be food alcohol but there'll always be stand-up comedy or comedy sitcoms playing on the tv versus like a sports bar hmm. and then the event center is on the same block so if anybody wants to do an actual performance you have the event center for the performances and then if you want to do a huge outdoor festival music thing there's the parking lot yeah. You know, and I you know, I got this big uh, inflatable projector screen. Yeah. And I'm like, man, this is fun. But you know, the first time is the by the halfway through the end, the projector screen's all tipped over. <laughs> I had it angled on the ground wrong. I ended up having to buy yeah, a, yeah, yeah. an industrial sized blower. Now it works, but it's like, you know, there's a lot of Would you have a leaf blower going? Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. You know, and, and it's like, but it's like, hey, you just got to do it. For sure. You got to move the big boulders. Yeah. And then just try it out. Yeah. And then go back and see what you could do better next time. And, you know, it's this long list that never ends of things to do. You just got to do what you can. And then I feel it's like, you. oh, shit, we ran out of time. We got to just go with it. Brick by brick, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I definitely, I definitely understand. So, talk to me about this venue that you just, you it just opened, right? Yeah, so it just opened. It wasn't quite ready. I was halfway through painting, so I got like one, you know what I mean? So I had to close out, but it's like a theater style. There's balcony seating. Uh, so by next month, uh, the balcony will be open. I mm. just didn't get the chance to paint it. Uh, just uh, So every, every week, every month, it's just uh, when people come in, they will see obvious growth. Like, wow, this is better than last time. It's kind of the goal. Is this going to be primarily a comedy venue? So this is why I'm saying event center, because I don't want it to be strictly comedy. Yeah. I will be doing comedy shows there. Yeah. I want to do a Friday, Saturday, weekly show where I bring out-of-town artists on a regular basis, but there still is opportunity for uh, other people to do shows and events, and yeah. you know what I mean? And my thing is, like, I think, people, you know, it's like, all right, we can try it, see if it works, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. before, you know, and, and then my only thing is that I just want to sit down afterwards Talk about what went good, what didn't go good. Yeah. I'm not signing any contracts or anything like that. We'll just try it out. If it works good, we keep keep it going. We can sure. sit back and renegotiate things. It, it seems like we have like a super budding comedy scene here. I mean, it's been budding for a while, but it seems like right now, like well, it's, yeah. there's a lot of comedy happening in Minnesota, but and maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me if I'm wrong. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of places to perform stand-up comedy. You know, I mean, we have, there's, you know, there's comedy clubs, yep. you know what I mean, where, you know, and I actually, you know, I was working really hard to have a comedy shows where I would pay either similar or more than what a comedy club would pay a headliner yeah. or a feature act or whatever. Yep. And then, uh, but then it doesn't take, you know, comedians with some business mindset, you figure out, you know, these people, you know, the money that you make, it's like, all right, this isn't rocket science. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to try to throw my own show. Yeah. I'm going to rent out a venue. I make the flyer. Now I'm in charge of the profit yeah. instead of somebody else making a few thousand bucks, giving you a couple hundred, 
Like, I'd rather be the one making the thousands than giving away the hundreds. For sure. You know, and yeah. you just have to find a space. Yeah. And now I have a, and then uh, I have people all the time. You know, I was doing uh, once every Friday shows all through COVID at the Poor House yep. uptown. Yep. And that was just turned into a well oiled machine where every week it was a packed house. And, you know, uh, through COVID, it was a COVID friendly event. People sit together, stuff like that. And then I would have people always calling me because they see I'm doing events here, Southdale, Poor House, uh, you know, other venues as well, Breakfast Bar, uh, whatever. I would, you know, throw in shows. So people are always calling me like, hey, do you got a venue I can get? Yeah. And I'm like, no, I just rent these places out like any regular person can do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or or promoter can do. I guess, you know, they might not rent it to anybody. Just uh, they want to make sure there's some type of organization there. But now I have a venue. And one thing that I didn't like is sometimes these venues want to charge you 3000 bucks. Yeah. You know? It's and crazy. then you got to book an artist. And then you got to pay a DJ. And then you got to pay this, that. And then now, now you're like, you know, you're putting up eight grand, hoping to make 10. Right. And it's, it's risky, it's scary, it's a little nerve wrecking. Yep. You know what I mean? Because yeah. now you're in the red zone and you got to have successes to get to that profit area. Yeah. So I'm trying to create a venue design where it's all based off percentages. For sure. So you don't got to put the money up. We'll win together, lose together. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you won't be left with this. You know what I mean? (laughs) If it doesn't go great in the beginning, because what some venues owners don't understand is that everything doesn't start out successful the first time. Most things don't. Most things don't. Yeah. But there's no system created to let somebody go through the growing pains and build something up into something that is actually really good. Yeah, you're right. You know? Yeah, that's a problem in the music scene as well. And not all artists are just rolling with a bank full of liquid cash. Again, most are not. <laughs> most people are not. Most people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Especially right now. I mean, we are in a, we're in a fucking recession. Yeah. And we're all acting like we're not. Yeah. This is the wildest time I've ever seen. I was, uh, not to get off topic, but. Yeah. With how prominent the internet is currently, it's never been more prominent. Yeah. But we're in a recession. Yeah. But the, according to the internet, everybody's rich. I mean, it's la- the wildest shit I've ever seen in my life. Last year, I had my first six figure year of my life. Wow. Congrats. And with as many kids as I got, I'm pretty sure I'm still below poverty. For real. You know what I mean? For like, real. I'm like, well. Yep. I'm with that, you. That, I think, I'm like, well, shoot, if that, I think I need to make sex seven figures because I didn't. Bro. That You know what I mean? That, yeah. like, it, I. Yeah. I felt like I had more money when I was on Section 8. Bro, yeah. <laughs> you're not fucking, you're not, I'm right there with you, you're not wrong. I feel the yeah. exact same way. Yeah. So very similar. First year after COVID, well, I mean, I guess it's still happening, I guess, but whatever. Yeah. The and, first year was the same. My, fam- now, my family had the most financially successful year, and it felt like. Yeah. They didn't move the needle barely. Where'd it go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's and that's why I really want to, uh, you know, being an artist, I really want to provide opportunities for artists to be able to make money yeah. doing their art. You know what I mean? And, you know, people are always, uh, you know, to let, you know, if you bring a celebrity or something, it's always like, well, it's good exposure, but you can't feed your family off of exposure. True you know what I mean? And uh, there's ways in, to create uh, opportunities for artists to be able to actually make some money and then have conversations with the artists like hey do you have uh do you have any merchandise to sell you know do you have a website you know what i mean like there's other ways that you could you know what i mean if i'm giving you a couple hundred dollars to come perform you can also you should also have a website a qr code somebody can scan and buy your music or buy your comedy or buy a shirt or a hat or a bag or you know super lack there's a super lack of that yeah and and that's and I think that's part of why I think what the things that you're doing are so important is you're not just you're not just creating success for yourself. You're creating you're putting other people in a position to be successful yeah. and creating a building a foundation, yeah. which is like we're missing. I feel like we're missing foundation in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. it's like there's no foundation for success. It's yeah. just everybody trying to do it themselves well, and, and figure and, it out. And, yeah, and it's like uh, sometimes it's the work that people do. Like people who are successful, mm-hmm. there's work that happens behind the scenes exactly. that people don't see. Yeah. You know, when yeah. I'm up at the four in the morning painting walls and moving heavy furniture and, you know, coming home in the middle of the night exhausted, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, this is what people don't see. Yeah, you know sure. what I mean? This yeah. is the work that a lot of people aren't willing to do yeah. to get to that 
point because yep. that's you know and then years of meeting people hundreds of no's and you know it takes hundreds and hundreds of no's sometimes to get that at yes yep. and some people get discouraged after one no for sure you know yep. imagine a hundred no's yep. at some point some people just say you know what this isn't going to work yep. not knowing that they're 130 no's away from their dreams coming true yeah you know yeah yeah man so let's change gears a little bit two-part question same question in two different areas first part top five stand-up comedians not just top five comedians doesn't have to be stand-up in minnesota and then i want your top five all time all right well uh see these are hard questions too because it's like you know people have different uh I want your streaks. I, so, I want yours. So I have a, you know, uh, it's it's hard to like number it down because you know what I mean. I've had uh, there's a lot of people on the thing, but so I can just kind of talk about when I first started doing comedy. Uh, Do nasty mm-hmm. was a comedian who had been doing comedy for a long time. He was great. I could see I would see him do hour of comedy and do another hour and be always switching up his routine. And then also. Uh, was already ahead of the game on the business aspect, doing his own shows. After my fourth show, he was getting me booked almost, you know, multiple times a month, mm. paid gigs every time. I've never had to do an unpaid show for years in the beginning, and that was a lot because of Do Nasty, who was talented, good friend, good at uh, the business aspect too. Yeah. And, uh, and then uh, from there... It was Adrian Washington, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, who's just, uh, he's just, uh, he's one of the best. I've, you know, I think he's definitely one of the top comedians. He's just, uh, he has, uh, his routine always changes. Uh, he uh, is also generous to new people. He mm-hmm. books people, pays people. You know, he's just a stand-up guy, really good comedian. He's having a lot of success now. You see him with... Uh, uh, Donnell Rawlins and going to Dave Chappelle's house, things like that. And mm-hmm. he was one of them people, like, it's a matter of time before, yeah. you know what I mean, before yeah. he's touring the country and, you For know sure. what I mean. And uh, and he made the, uh, you know, the change. So he went to doing comedy full time because he knew he had it, you know. Another person was uh, Shed G, had a long run of shows, and he was always one of those people who he was just ahead of the game. And, you know, from when I started, he had uh, – he was good with the business side. He's funny. He's got a uh, uh, versatile where he could do church shows and uh, you know what I mean. So there's different style of comedians. I was more like I get a lot of the urban gigs. Yeah. You know what I mean. I think and, I read an article where somewhere about how you feel uncomfortable performing in a room full of white people. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 nerve wracking. It gets my anxiety up. <laughs> you know what I mean. The only time I've ever not not done great was a room full of old white people. It was like a, one of those corporate shows, and people were always like, "Man, yeah. you could do both." And I'm like, actually, I'm not really used to being around <laughs> a lot of white people. I didn't yeah. grow up with a lot of white friends. My whole my routine is, uh, you know, my success is literally uh, revolved around black women in all of my business. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like I've uh, all my kids are mixed. The black women are most likely you know, are the, are the prominent group of people who come to the shows. They love comedy. And not that it's geared towards that. It's just kind of how it plans out. When I do my real estate meetings, it's mostly black women that show up, you know. And it's kind of the time of the black woman right now where they sure. are just, like, starting businesses. Yeah. They are they don't want to be managed, you know what I mean? They don't want to be, you know, talked to a certain way. They want to be respected. For sure. And they want to be entrepreneurs. And there's just, like, there's this Black Women's Wealth Alliance, and it's just it's just incredible to see. Um, Embr- embracing that power that, yeah. they, that they've always had. Yeah, that they've always had. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, I think right now probably the hottest comedian in Minnesota is Ashley Henderson, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, with yeah. her viral success and her freestyle skills and – She's my favorite person to have host any show. I was literally all my shows. I'm like, you got to host every one. You're just too good. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then I can run around and do stuff, and she just always makes every show entertaining. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just never get sick of watching her. Um, the Baddies crew, you know what I mean? I kind of put them in one. Brandon, Bruce, uh, Pierre, you know, they started uh, the first black-owned comedy club, mm-hmm. you know, made history. Kevin Hart came here yep. and shot Heart of the City, mm-hmm. you know. and uh, But those are... Um, uh, there's and then and then like Bianca Denny and Sosa McCain are two mm-hmm. newer comics that are just come in yep. and just making noise and they're just you know just kind of uh, just coming in and just skipping the steps that people say you yeah. should have to 
do and yeah. do all these open mics and yeah. people like them come in like no nope, i'm good right now yeah you know sure. pay, pay me yeah to come yeah yeah <laughs> and uh that's yeah a, so that's a solid list yeah so how, that's, about, how about that all-time list man all time man you know i grew up uh i grew up i was it was like any evening at the improv my parents used to watch and then i watched like a lot of comic view um all time, I mean Richard Pryor, George Carlin. When you come to the old school comics, you mm -hmm. know what I mean. And then, uh, and then like Bernie Mac, Cat Williams, kind of stand out when I think about all time favorites. Uh, Dave Chappelle is obviously one of the uh, smartest, cleverest comedians. But Chappelle is like Tupac to me. Yeah, he's just uh, he's not even in that. Yeah, you could take him out of any top five conversation. He's above that. Yeah, he's and then, he's elevated into a different realm. And too. then like uh. Like and then like Bill Bellamy is like probably on yeah. the top of my list because this guy um, was the first one to give me an opportunity and brought me on tour with yeah. them and me and Bill Bellamy I got booked for a show Bill Bellamy it was like a spring snowstorm it was yeah. like this huge snowstorm we got snowed in to this venue and we literally had to do two shows for the same crowd yep. because we were all stuck there yeah. you know and I remember there's this girl who was like uh, man I just tried to call an Uber. I offered the Uber a blowjob, and he still wouldn't come pick me up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so then we're doing the next show, and I'm like, you know what? This girl right here, she just called an Uber, offered him a blowjob. He still wouldn't come. I said, I just checked my email, and I saw they're offering $500 bonuses to sign up for Uber. I'm about to, after the show, I'm about to get a $500 bonus, and my dick sucked when I leave this place. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then it gets better. Uh, then after the show, you know, Bill Bellamy, he's sitting out there. He heard the joke, and uh, she's kind of being a little flirtatious with Bill. But, you know, he's pl he's a player, how to be a player right, himself. You know what I mean? He made uh, – I haven't got caught cheating since 1996 because of that guy. You know? <laughs> 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 so he ended up asking me. He was like, hey, man. Cause she, was, she was fly. You know what I mean? She was, like, from down south, had a little accent. He was like, hey, man, you mind if I give her a ride home? I said, of course not, Bill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And he was like, I like this guy. And then, you know, I remember, you know, and then I, I was thinking, I'm like, you know, Bill Bellamy, you know, uh, he taught me how to never get caught cheating my whole life. I owe a lot to you. But that's now it's big, like, what's big. up? With, what's, but now I got all these kids by all these different women, Bill. When we gonna come out with the sequel, How to Be a Father? Like, show Ooh. me that too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, no, uh, no cap though. Bill is a, Bill Bellamy is a very, uh, he doesn't. He probably didn't get the credit he deserves. And then to go on tour with him, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and to see him do an hour, yeah, hour and a half. Yep. See him do two shows in a row, two different hours. Yeah. And some of the stories he has. Was that your first experience seeing something like that, like, like a legend, like really go like that? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yep. Yeah. And that that kind of like before that, uh, my biggest show, I had got booked to do the Orpheum, mm -hmm. which was you know the most money I ever made on a show. Yep. It was me, D. Ray. And little Duval with Shed G as the host. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And I was so excited. And then I'm like, I'm like in the dressing room. Uh, there's like all these bottles. There's like 20 bottles of liquor and food. And I'm in there. I'd have popped the bottle, poured myself a drink. And then D-Ray comes in the dressing room. He's like, what the, who the hell are you? What the hell are you doing drinking all my liquor? <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. I thought I, I thought I made it, man. I thought this was our dressing room. <laughs> you tapped into, into D-Ray's rider. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so I was like, oh shit, you know what I mean? Rookie right. mistake, you know. So, this is my first big celebrity show, and then he ended up looking on the outside of the door, and he's like, you know what? It doesn't say my name on the outside of the door. Right. You know what I mean? That's a, Funny. you know what I mean? You gotta let it go then. You gotta let it go, yeah. and then he's like, you know, uh, he just he was just like, you just keep this bottle, and I literally, I didn't even go for the the Casamigos or the Patron. I went for like, all right. He probably don't want this Jameson. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I was actually yeah, like yeah. trying to considerably drink like one of the cheaper bottles yeah. because. But I'm like I'm I made it this far. I don't need to be out there just getting paying for drinks with them regular people out there. Like Absolutely you know what I mean? Not. I'm a celebrity today. So he's he, like, keep the bottle, but get the fuck out. Nah, he hang out. He was cool with oh, it okay. afterwards. And then he was like, I mean, but then he used the example. He was like, well, if there's a giant pile of cocaine on the table, would you help yourself to that? I said, at this point, yes, I would. I felt like this was ours. Yeah. You know what I mean? I felt like this was yeah. for the entertainment. I Especially didn't just, if it's I'm a not coming pile in. of cocaine. And yeah. The, yeah, and I'm like, just come and watch me perform. You know what I mean? See, you know what I mean? I worked hard to earn this. You've been, you know what I mean? You're on TV shows. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you got to think back to when you first started. You know what I mean? This is like my... 
this is a big deal to me. You said this stuff to him? Yeah. Oh, wow. You know, so we had a good conversation. He was pissed off at first. And I think, you know, there might have been some other stuff. He kind of came in a little crabby. And I'm like, dude, you're giving me a fucking anxiety attack right before my biggest show. You know what I mean? Like, shit, I'm already nervous than a motherfucker. You want to come in here talking about I can't be in a dressing room? What the hell? Where am I supposed to sit? Help me out, D-Ray. I'm new to this, you know? Then, you know, but I was, you know, I'm able to at least communicate what's going on. You know what I mean? I didn't, you know, like. Did he come watch you? I don't think so. Fucking D-Ray. But I don't know. I don't know. I was, you know what I mean? I was I was yeah. focused on the crowd, and I didn't, um, yeah. You I, get a, did you get a chance to talk to Duval? Not that time. So he had a separate dressing room. It was on the other side of the, you know, the Orpheum's got all these little tunnels and yeah. rooms, and he had a private dressing room. But then I ended up, uh, that's actually what led to me going on tour with Bill Bellamy. Little Duval came back to do some shows with a different promoter. And I got a hold of him. I'm like, hey, last time Lil Duval was here, I opened up and I got a standing ovation as the opening act. Maybe you guys, I'd be a good opener. I got a good following. I bring people, sold myself. They said, all right, come on in and uh, we'll give you three minutes, see what you got. You know, okay. I went and did three minutes and I got off the stage. And they said, why'd you stop? You were killing them. I said, you don't want to say three minutes. And they're like, all right, we'll come back tomorrow. Oh, don't. And then I ended up doing five shows with Lil Duval. And uh, the first day I didn't didn't talk to him he was in his dress room but then the second day um some dude walks up to me and gives me a big old bag of weed like hey this is for little duval so you know what i mean i'm like well now i got a reason i gotta go in the dressing room yet again got, I, I, yet I, again you're in the you're in the possession of somebody else's substance yeah yeah so i'm like all right i gotta get this to little duval I go in there i'm like hey um here, this is a gift from me, little Duval. No. Oh, <laughs> no, so. oh, no, that would have been the finesse right there. <laughs> but then, uh, but then we ended up hanging out for hours. You know what I mean? Smoking, hanging out. Uh, got to you know talk to some of his. I hear, guys. I hear he's really full of wisdom. Yeah, yeah, he's actually you know uh, like a pretty nice asshole. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know. But yeah. it's, I mean, it's uh. You know, when at some level of fame, like, it's okay to say, hey, you know what, I'm not, you know, and that's the thing that I learned. It's like, it's not making friends with the comedians that's going to get me booked to do these shows. No. It's the person that books the comedian that you want to build a right. relationship with. So yep. it's not Little Duval. All, all I want from them is, hey, let me just get my picture for my social media. So, yeah. you know what I mean? Just yep. sort of my record of who I've performed with so I can keep racking up this list of celebrities I've performed with you just said something that's really key right there though that people don't think about is like duval is not going to be probably the one that's going to put he doesn't you in sign artists right you know yeah. he doesn't book shows it's a very important thing I think yeah music musical acts need to remember that too yeah it's like, like you shaking hands with two chains and hanging out with him that yeah. don't get you nothing yeah you got a gotta, photo op you got to figure out who's paying that guy that'd be like me expecting <laughs> adam 22 from no jumper to put me on like yeah yeah. Why the fuck would he do that? Yeah. That's so. not what he does. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, he's not going to put live on Lake Street on No Jumper. Yeah. I mean, my, just, I mean, he might interview me maybe, but you know what I mean? Like, it's it's a similar, it's a, that's a that's a really key point that you just made. It's yeah. true. Yeah. So it's true. Just something to think about, you know, because even, you know, I have people calling me like, you know, uh, will you teach me how to be a comedian? You know? Or is, that, show. is it really teachable? And that's the thing. It's like, well... For one, I'm like, how about you just come to a show? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the first. I can provide a stage for you. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, maybe someday I'll try to create a comedy class and coaching system. But, you know, I mean, and I actually have created one for high school students. You know yeah. what I mean? But it took me to have some youth. I was really motivated when it was a group of youth for that sure. I could benefit. But sometimes it's like when you're a grown adult, sometimes you got to figure some stuff out yourself. For real. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think some people just want you to do it for them. Yeah. And you can't do that. Like, yeah. I can't tell your life story. My comedy routine is around life experiences. You yeah. know what I mean? My kids write most of my jokes for me. Yeah. Just the stuff that happens in my house. <laughs> yeah. You know, you get in a, my, you know, my crazy baby mom, she wrote my first 15 minute routine, you know, yeah. just from just her erratic behavior. It was like, wow, this is hilarious. <laughs> You know, and I literally <laughs> used comedy to handle one of the most stressful situations I've ever dealt with. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was yeah. a domestically abused man using humor to get out of. <laughs> well, I mean, shit. Sometimes what you got to do. That's I think that's key. That's one of the uh, great things that stand-up comedians have is yeah, they have something to channel that pain. Yeah. 
And then, and then it's funny too when you get somebody in the audience like, "Oh, I remember when she did that shit." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't lying. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, we need to wrap, man. But this has been a fun conversation. Um, but before we go, you've given a lot of game in this episode. Yeah. But if you could to give them some game segment, talk to some of these young entrepreneurs, young uh, comedians that are trying to figure things out. Give them a little bit of game on maybe how they can get started so i would say uh you know have a logo have things to sell have merchandise have a website be able to you know what i mean everywhere you go some people might not even listen to you some people more people are willing to buy your music than they are to listen to it mm. you know what i mean so have stuff for sale at all mm. times everywhere you go have a credit card with a qr code that it can scan and go to something that's purchasable from you because you can use that to fund your dreams because you know what i mean it takes money to make stuff happen you know you can't go you know, travel around and doing shows without a little backup funny money. Even if you get paid a thousand bucks to do a show in Atlanta, it might cost you fifteen hundred. You got to understand right, that yeah. you got to make some of those sacrifices in the beginning, and it costs money to make money in any business. You know, so you got to have a business plan that makes money off of your work, your talent. Your you should, everybody should have a logo. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have something that you could put on a shirt. It should or, really be the first thing you do. Yeah, yeah, and then like uh, uh, put it up. Uh, uh, Ricky Collins, he has this uh, streaming platform called Packed House That's Live. Right. You know what I mean? Shout where you Ricky. can, yeah, where you can monetize your content and you can, uh, you know, just uh, you can sell things through through. Uh, you can put your stuff on Packed House Live and you can uh, sell it and make money off of it. You yeah. know, you sell a million dollar streams, you get a million dollars. We've learned that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So you know, a hundred thousand. If you sell a hundred thousand things for a dollar, you got a hundred thousand dollars. So yeah. have something for sale, even if it's for a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, but always have for it for sure. sale. And then now you're making twenty, thirty, forty bucks, and that might be gas money that gives you the possibility to move back and forth. Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially if you want to be a full time artist and you're not selling anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's probably a struggle. And we do got a movie coming out starring me and Ashley through Packed House Live. It's called Switcheroo. Okay. Uh, so it's a movie about me and Ashley getting stuck in each other's bodies. It's trading be, some trading places shit. Yeah, some trading places. Like yeah, a little, little Freaky Friday action. So, okay. Yeah, so look for that drop. And I think uh, July 29th, we're going to have a big premiere for that movie uh, that Ricky Collins is directing. Dope. And it's going to be streamed on Packed House Live. And it'll be the first... Uh, profit sharing movie that that i can ever think of so yeah. we all get percentages of the profit and it's kind of a fun way to do things instead of just getting a paycheck sometimes it's like you want a paycheck or percentages yeah and don't be scared of working percentages because sometimes three you know three hundred dollars might sound more like more than three percent but sometimes that three percent could end up being three hundred thousand exactly depending on yeah almost never take the bag up front when it comes to stuff like that yeah yeah so for sure. Yeah. That's dope, man. You got a lot of dope shit going on. Yeah. And I'm glad we could do this. Yeah, you too, man. I appreciate it, man. I was looking forward to doing this someday. You yeah, know what I mean? I'm glad sure. I got it, got it out of here. Got to do an interview with my doppelganger. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm thinking like maybe maybe for Halloween I can save some money on a co costume and just be Jake Faircloth this you could. year. <laughs> you could. We might have to do it. I might have to do We might have to do the, I know. We might have to do the switcheroo. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be an easy so one. So where, where can they find you? Where can they, how can they book your venue? Give them all that information before we get out of here. So my name is Elliot Vreeland, you know, uh, with a V like Victor. So E-L-L-I-O-T-V-R-E-E-L-A-N-D on all social media platforms. I own a website called uh, Club Lot. So I've started a club in the parking lot. It's our own club lot. Uh, okay. Lot.club.com. So you can find me at lot.club. That's where all the ticket sales are so i own my own website for processing tickets so i don't have to pay event price so you don't have to pay the you know seven to twenty dollar event bright tax fee yep you know what i mean you could just yep. go straight to my website yep. and uh yeah so lot.club the venue's location is 1407 washington uh august 5th and 6th i'll be doing an outdoor Common, another outdoor comedy music festival and try to keep that growing. So uh, I tried to make some phone calls quick before I got here to announce who was going to be the next artist. But uh, I'm waiting for someone to get off their plane. But I got, uh, I'm got i planning on every show just having a little bit of growth and the artists just continuing to grow. For sure. Yeah. Dope. So. Dope, man. Well, I appreciate your time. This is a good conversation. I appreciate it. Again, you. I'm glad we could do it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Elliot Breland. This has been another episode of Minnesota's number one daily show, live on Lake Street. I'm Jake Faircloth. Follow me everywhere at Jake Faircloth. Damn, water. In high school, I let it bam, water. I wasn't playing, water. I'm coming straight out the south. Hey, genius, best watch your mouth. When I pull up on PNB, right, then, then, then he come out. You moving out.
ounces. I just moved a hundred things in a drought. You want the south side, outside the fence of your house. You talking all that, then then wanna come talk it out. If you ain't talking money, f you talking about. I gives a f what you do. I'm about mine. I just look at the watch. Said it's about time. She in love with my status. Said if you don't mind what I do to chief up, I said the south side.